Good morning, everybody. I said good morning, everybody. Let's all stand this morning as we go to the Lord and worship. Anybody got victory in Jesus? I've been singing this song since I was a little boy. Still have the victory. How about you? Amen? Well, I heard an old, old story. I was saying it came from the Lord. to have you. Turn around and shake somebody's hand. Get out of your seat. Introduce yourself. Tell them how glad you are that they came.
good to have the victory. We're glad you're here this morning and uh, glad that you've decided on this pretty. I wish every day in December and January and February was like today. Amen. I'm a warm weather kind of fella, but uh, we're just thankful you're here this morning. And I want to say I appreciate all of you just taking the time to be in the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So it's a good place to be. If you're here for the first time, we want to say greetings from CPR, City Point Restoration. We're glad you came, and uh, we love everybody here. We love when we see you folks walk in the door. We want you to feel at home, uh, feel like you're amongst people that love you and care about you. And can we just give them just a hand clap of appreciation? Amen. And uh, just uh, if you can fill out that connect card, we'd love to know a little bit more about you. Just put it in the offering bag. We'd appreciate that. We do want to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And we want God to bless and strengthen us. And uh, uh, Kevin, if you could put that picture of uh, Jamarion on the, on, the, on the screen for us. Uh, we've been praying for a little boy named Jamarion. He had an uh, aneurysm about three weeks ago. He's at MCV, had about, I think about a 12-hour surgery to relieve the bleeding on his brain. He's, he's getting better. I went by and seen him yesterday. He gave me a thumbs up, as you can see, as he's getting better. And uh, he's eight years old, still has a long ways to go, but we believe the Lord has touched him and is going to continue to touch him. In a little while, we're going to give you an opportunity, if you can, to give. Uh, his mom's the only one that's able to provide for the family. She's had to stay at the hospital with him quite a bit, not being able to log hours in at work. And so y'all can understand the financial strain that they may be under. So today we're going to take up an offering and we're going to give them some support. One of the things I love about our church is when we see a need, we meet a need. And we've really been blessed to be able to do that. And I know that as I meet a need, God will supply all the needs I have. It's sort of the way the Lord works. He when you're able to help someone else, the Lord will help you out down the road. Maybe you're in a place where you say, I'm, Pastor, pray for them. If you don't have anything to give, just pray for them. But if you're able to help and support, if you want to write a check, if you want to write a check, just give a cash offering. If you want to write a check, just write a CPR, put it in an envelope, say Jamarion, or just say the little boy in the hospital. And uh, we'll, uh, is it Jamarion? Jamarion. It's, it, actually, his nickname's Fat Fat. And that's what I normally call him. But uh, anyway, if you could just today as we continue to pray, we want to pray for him. Of course, we want to pray for the many others. I know several that are still battling flu bug and other ongoing physical issues. And we just want to pray for them. Pray for PJ. PJ's not here. He won't be here for the next couple of weeks. He's going to be going and visiting some family and spending time with folks. And I understand that completely. February the 8th, PJ is going in for major surgery. We're believing. We still believe. I still believe they can open him up and say, wait a minute. What we thought was there is not there. But if the Lord chooses to use the chemotherapy, I believe God can bring healing. Whatever God chooses, we're okay with. We're just standing in belief that God's going to bring healing. So you lift him up. I want you to say a pr special prayer this morning for Matt Schoenfeld. We believe in God's opening up a door for him to be able to get healing as well. How many know the healing comes in all shapes and all sizes? And I believe God can bring healing into that young man's life too, so we're going to pray for him. And you may be here this morning and say, Pastor, I need, a, I need someone in my life. I need a touch. Or I need to touch myself. Just raise your hand. Raise that hand. Lord knows all about it. We might not be able to comprehend it, but my God is able to comprehend all things. And so in faith, we want to pray right now. God touch us. And finally, we want to pray God's will be done in the service this morning. How many know that God don't want you to leave the same way you came? Amen. So let's just lift up a prayer right now and ask God to touch us. Father, we're thankful we have victory in Christ Jesus. We're thankful, God, that your presence is always with us. Thankful, God, that you go before us and you are our ever-present help. So, Lord, we just do with confidence right now. and We say, Father, touch every need in this house. Touch your Marion, God, in the hospital. Touch BJ, God. Touch his body. Bring healing. Lord, I pray for Matt right now, God. In, in, Lord, just minister to him. Lord, renew his mind this day. And God, the many other needs. I know there's several that need a touch from you, God. I pray for Johnny Wellington. It's at home, God, dealing with some issues. And there's several, Lord, many, many others. I know shut-ins that need a healing from you. God, touch each one. Strengthen them, Lord. Let them sense your presence even as we pray. 
But God, we need you to show up today in a special way. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. God, reveal to us, oh God, what we have need of. And God, we'll give you praise and we'll give you glory for it. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. Just want to make a couple of announcements. I'm going to ask the ushers to prepare and giving them. Tonight we have a special call. Basically, it's our annual business meeting. Uh, I'll be sharing uh, where God has brought us from. 2017, I'll be sharing some financial reports. And, uh, and I'll be sharing about some things we're going to be doing in 2018. Uh, I believe God's got us moving forward. I believe God's got us uh, on the cusp of doing some great and wonderful things for the kingdom. And I'll be sharing my vision for 2018. If you're here, you don't have to be a member. If you just like to come and hear a little bit, come on and be with us. It'll be at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. I'm asking for all of you again to come tonight. I'm excited about what God has in store for us. I'd love for you to be here to hear more about it. Come tonight at 5 o'clock. Now, I know there's some songbirds out there. 5 o'clock, we got a choir practice. And how many love the music of the choir? Amen. So we want to start our choir and try to get going again. If you'd like to be a part of the choir, come and be here at 5 o'clock for our first practice of the new year. And there's many, many other wonderful things. We're getting ready to go to Peru in a couple weeks. Excited about the trip. We also want to pray for Brother Davis. I didn't mean to forget him, but Brother Davis, you say, well, where is Brother Davis? He is sick today. He texted me early this morning. He was sick yesterday, went to bed. Got up this morning, wasn't feeling any better. So we want to pray for him, that God would touch him and bring healing to his body. We've got a lot to pray about, but we believe God's on the job and he's there able to do great and mighty things. Amen? I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward to receive our offering this morning. And as you give, just remember, God sees your need. He understands your situation. Just trust in him. And I know that he will provide. Brother Tom, would you say a prayer this morning over this offering? Father, we come to you this morning in Jesus' holy name, Lord. We thank you for your love, your strength, your grace, Lord. We pray, God, that you would draw us so we can run after you, Lord. Pray, God, that you pour your spirit out upon us, Lord, and keep your loving hands upon us, Lord. I pray for everything that's said and everything that's done. Let it be to the upbuilding, uplifting of your kingdom, Lord. We pray, God, that you bless those that have to give. There with God and those that don't. We pray, God, this not one would leave here without knowing you as a personal Savior. We love you, we praise you, we give you glory, and we give you honor in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. endures forever. I know that I'm, all, I'm not always the most lovable person, but God loves me in spite of me. And he loves us all the same. If you're here this morning, so I don't know if anybody loves me. Just remember, God loves you. Give thanks to the Lord, our God. His love endures forever.
gonna carry on His love endures forever today the Lord for his faithfulness God we're so thankful for your love that endures thankful God that you are purest of all things Lord you're holy you're righteous God we need you in our lives oh Lord God we need your presence Lord to help us through these troubled waters of life oh Lord for your strength God Help us to see you, Lord. Help us to know you. I saw the Lord seated on his throne. He was clothed in glory. And exalted. train of road it filled the temple and the angels gathered around me and cried
the Word of God states that though the angels may sing, and it's a beautiful song, that the song that the Lord wants to hear is the song of the redeemed. You see, we got reason to sing today because I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was once mired up in some things and situations there was no way out of. But because a loving God saw me at my worst and knew what I would be at my best, he gave his son for me. So this morning, can we exalt him? For he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of all glory. And he's worthy of all honor. Amen. We exalt you, Lord, in this house. And we sing our praises to you. Lord, thou old Lord. is near and I just pray right now God that as we prepare our hearts for your word let our ears hear what you have to say and God let our hearts be tender toward your voice Father I pray that every distraction that would be in this place God would just be removed in the name of Jesus and that God with clarity God your word would come like that sharp two edged sword cutting us God healing us revealing to us God each one individually God a plan and a purpose for their life thank you Lord for your grace thank you Lord for your mercy and have your way in this place we ask in Christ's name amen you may be seated
Lord. Somebody give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning preaching this sermon. Thinking about this sermon. Praying that God would help me to share this sermon in the way that really I felt that needed to be shared. Pay no mind to these crazy guys behind me. I love using illustrations. I think it's the coolest way of making you remember something. Some of you sometimes won't hear a word I say, but you give me a prop, and boy, y'all won't forget. One time I preached, when I was a youth pastor, I've told several of y'all this story. I was teaching our youth group about the power of the tongue, and I went to a local uh, meat cutting company, and I bought me a big old cow tongue. <laughs> Any of y'all ever seen a cow tongue? Yeah. Things about that long. And I'm up there preaching and wagging that cow tongue. <laughs> Twenty years later, some of them kids might not have heard what I said, but they remember that cow tongue. I'm going to use a little bit of an illustrative sermon this morning. Hopefully it'll be something that impacts your life. For me, a, a table is a powerful place. Some of my fondest memories were at a table. When I was a kid growing up, that's where we had supper time. That's where we, kept, we were able to catch up on what was going on. And mom and dad would sit down with us and mom would prepare the meal and we'd eat that meal and we'd have great times around that place. And I've carried that tradition on in my own family. i uh, our kids live close enough to where we're able to have, have regular meals. And Vicki and I so look forward to having them come over. And it's getting even better because we got grandkids now. We're able to see those grandkids. And just being able to catch up and joke and laugh and just be a part of each other's life. It's no place like a family around a table that really makes a huge difference uh, in, in one's life and gives you encouragement. And so today I want to talk about a place at the table. I think all of us need to understand we have a place at the table. I want to share an Old Testament story with you this morning. Maybe you'll be able to identify with this character in the story. But when I talk about meals and tables, I was reminded as I was researching and studying for this sermon about a story told of a, a, a lady who was preparing a meal. They had just received a new couple in to be pastors of their church, and this couple had a fairly significant sized family, maybe similar to my family, you know, big. And her husband decided to invite them, to invite them over for dinner. And so she was charged with preparing this meal. And she had a little four year old boy uh, named Johnny. And of course, Johnny followed his mom around. At this age, he's able to walk and he's listening and he's observing his mom. And the whole day, She's preparing this meal. She's complaining about this meal. She's complaining about her husband and inviting these people she don't know over here to eat with them. She doesn't know what they really like. She's scared they're not going to like the food she's preparing. and she just, She's just so frustrated, but she does the meal the best she can. So as they gather around the table that day and that evening and begin to uh, prepare to eat, the father traditionally says the prayer, but he's, he's been praying with his little son, Johnny, and he decides that today he's going to let Johnny show off a little bit and say a prayer. So he says, Johnny, I want you to say the prayer over the meal. And of course, he does what little four-year-olds do. He, he, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for the food. And just, utter, you know, just shares that prayer. But at the end of the prayer, he was hearing his mom basically out of frustration talking to God during the day. And she was saying things like, I can't understand why, Lord, I'm doing this. Lord, give me strength. Lord, give me, I don't understand why I've got to feed these strange people I don't even know. And at this point, little Johnny says, and Lord, help mom figure out why she had to fix this meal for these strange people we're about to eat with. <laughs> she wasn't really prepared for that. Embarrassed her a little bit. I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, when a kitchen table it's one of those things where maybe strangers come in and some people feel welcome, some people don't. I know where I grew up, my dad said you know, we, we did breakfast every Saturday morning and we brought everybody. When I got into youth ministry, I brought teams of young people came in. It didn't matter where they came from, what color their skin was. When breakfast was served, the table was there for everyone to eat at. 
And I think that's what we get the picture of in Scripture. In fact, the Bible declares in Revelation that at the end of the age, there's going to be a great banquet table that's going to be there for all that have given their hearts to the Lord that want to come and they can dine with the Master. We used to sing a song, Come and dine, the Master calleth. Come and dine. You can sup with Jesus' table all the time. And so that's a beautiful place. But it hasn't always been that way. In fact, it's not always that way in the day and age in which we live. And I'm, I'm reminded of a story of a young man that through no fault of his own, he had no table to sit at. He was separated from his family when he was five years old. Not something he did, but because of some things his grandfather did. And he lost a lot of what he knew. And in the process of losing these things, he found out that there was nothing for him. He felt like he was... No future, no hope, no anything. And we pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9 about a king who was gracious and a king who was kind and a king that had a connection with him that he didn't know about until he was reminded of that sometime later. In this particular story, we read about David, King David, one of my favorite people in the Bible. and was one that God even declared was a man after his own heart. We see where David asked about this young man. He says, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I want you to just hold on to that little part there, Jonathan's sake. For some, he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba, the king asked. Yes, sir, I am, he replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. And David asked, where is he? And the young man said, he is in Lodabar. And Ziba told him, at the home of Machir, son of Emil. We find here a young man that's been separated from all that he's loved. A man that has no place to go. In fact, this young man's in hiding. We understand that through the Old Testament, when a king was was destroyed or his kingdom passed and it was passed on to another most of the time those kings that had taken over that kingdom would just just wipe out that entire family race they would kill each one of them for fear that someone from that king would raise up and take the kingdom back over and so we find here Mephibosheth which is his name is, is crippled up. Now, the reason he's crippled, in chapter 4 we find out that when Saul and Jonathan were defeated in battle by the Philistines and they were killed, that the nurse that was taking care of him grabbed him up, running for fear of their lives. She fell and he was dropped and he broke both of his feet that never recovered. So we find here a broken young man that has nowhere to go, has no table to sit at, and we wonder what will become of him. I can see some parallels in this story for you and I. I can see some things maybe that you've dealt with that I've dealt with in the course of my life. Has anybody ever felt broken today? Has anybody ever felt like you just weren't any good for anything anymore? That, that things just weren't in place for you to do the things that you needed? You were damaged goods. Anybody ever felt like damaged goods? Like, you know, there's just nothing. This young man, his family is gone. His, his legs are gone. He's dependent on other people. And he's, he's just someone that's crippled. There's just no use for him anymore. There's nothing that he can do. He's just a crippled up young man that, that's marked. We know that the king is out there. And if the king finds out that this young man is someone that's, that's out there and alive, he may come and search for him. And he may kill him. He's not only crippled, he's, he's worthless. There's nothing he can do to help himself he's just no good to nobody anywhere and then finally he's just defeated there's nothing in his life worth saving anyway there's nothing that he can do I deal with people all the time I have conversations with people maybe you're here this morning maybe you feel like damaged goods maybe you feel like you've done something that you just can't recover from or maybe you come from a family line of failures and you feel like failure is just in your bloodline there's nothing you can do about it you might as well just get used to being damaged goods. There's just absolutely nothing that you can do about it. You feel like that if you try, there's no sense in trying because nothing good's going to come of it. So you just feel like you're defeated, worthless, crippled. Nothing good will come of your life. There's a lot of people that feel like damaged goods. 
Mephibosheth felt that way. I can only imagine how badly he felt. For many people, their greatest fear is that people will find out how they really feel about themselves. We do a good job of putting on a smiley face, don't we? We do a good job of pretending everything's okay. But inside, we're dying. Inside, we feel like this lost person that just has no place to go, no place to find. Just, just it seems like one disappointment after another. Just, there's nothing I can do about it. And, and I can imagine how Mephibosheth, just every day, someone coming to wait on him. Every day, somebody just, just and then every day, that thought coming into his mind. What if King David finds out I'm alive? What if somebody finds out where I really came from? What if somebody finds out what I've done? What if somebody finds out who the real me is? They'll never love me. They'll never care about me. They'll never give me an opportunity. And so we fall into these types of places. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 that all of us, because of Adam, our father, because of the sin that entered into his life, that sin entered the world. And Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone's sin. Can I tell you, we all have sat in the seat of Mephibosheth. We've all been separated. We've all been undone. It's amazing to me how sometimes in life we get saved and we forget where we came from. You know, some people walk into this church and they see you where you're at now, but man, if they could have saw you when you started. So we walk into a church and we're thinking, these people would never understand where I've been. And what you don't know is they were sitting in the same place you were sitting in 25 years ago. They were dealing with the same struggles. It amazed me when we decided to become partners with McShin Foundation and we had a church meeting. And of course, we're helping people that are recovering from addiction. And as we begin to share, I, multi, I mean, numerous ones raised their hands. Ones that man, they just looked like they'd always just had it all together. You know what I'm saying? They looked like, man, everything. They stepped said, 25 years ago, I was addicted to cocaine. I was doing, I had a nothing. I didn't know where I was going. So many times we find ourselves at this worthless state. We find ourselves at this place where we think nobody would understand. And the truth be, all of us have been there. All of us have suffered loss. All of us have felt like there's nothing we can do to get past this place. But I'm here to tell you that, that because of this sin that Adam, that, that he allowed to enter into his life through that first man, that all of us are under the burden of sin. Under All of us have been dropped and we're crippled and we don't, we, maybe we don't know how we're going to get to that next place. And we need to understand that everybody is damaged goods. All of us have some damage that's been done to us. So that's one thing we need to understand. But here's the deal. When you're damaged goods, where do you go? See, he went to hang out at a place called Lodabar. Now, the, the literal translation to Lodabar means no pasture. Means no place where nothing lives. Nothing is, is, is cultivated. It's just a place of death. And when people are damaged goods, they tend to end up at Lodabar. Lodabar, nobody cares about nobody. At Lodabar, you're just getting through the day. Whatever it takes to feel good for the day, that's what you do. If you know, it takes a little alcohol to feel good, that's what you do. If it takes going to find somebody to forget your problems, that's what you do. There's no place of uh, nurturing. There's no place where you can be, be rebuilt and revived. No, there's no purpose to load a bar. There's no possibility to load a bar. There is no plan in load a bar. Load a bar is just where you go to die. Nothing positive can happen. I'm amazed in the day and age in which we live. I see so many walking dead people. People that are just getting through. They have no plan. They have no future. They just think if I can just get to tomorrow, that's good enough. Mephibosheth had been just put into that place where he felt like there was nothing else that could happen. No fault of his own. My feet are crippled. I'm on the run from the king. If he finds out I'm alive, I'm surely going to die. So I'm just going to hang out at Lodabar and where every other loser on the earth sits. And we'll just get through life and we'll just make things happen the best way we can. No expectation of anything positive 
just trying to live life out the best I know how. Here's the deal. Some people live by the attitude, have no expectations so that you're never disappointed. You ever realize that? Do you ask yourself, what is your expectation of life? How many know that you get what you expect? Good or bad? So if you're expecting nothing, you're not planning for nothing, guess what? Load of bars where you're living right now. Load of bars where you're hanging out. See, David wasn't that load of bar. David was hanging out at the palace. David was a worshiper of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. David had been changed by this Lord. David had a kindness in his heart. So we know that through Romans chapter 5, again, revisiting that chapter, which is a beautiful chapter. If you want to see the whole story of man's struggle, it's right there in chapter 5. But in 17, it says, for the sin of this one man, Adam calls death to rule over many. How many know that you're ruled over by death when you let Lodabar be your place of existence? It's just a place that just continues to perpetuate something that will not bring life. But what... Mephibosheth didn't understand, which is a beautiful part of the story. Go read it. Years earlier, Jonathan and David had developed a connection. See, Jonathan was the son of Saul, who was the former king, who really tried to kill David numerous times, but Jonathan had developed such a kinship with David that they had made a covenant with one another that they were going to look out for one another and that they were going to take care of one another and they would stand with the other and even in death Jonathan never before that moment of his last breath ever did anything to harm David and David had such a love and an affection for Jonathan that he decided that he needed to continue on the legacy of Jonathan can I tell you you have an enemy of your life he is trying to destroy you and he's trying to destroy your seed he's doing everything he can to bring problems into your life he's doing everything he can to make you stay in load of bar but I've got news for you today that is enemy doesn't have any control because there was a covenant made long ago by my father in heaven and my big brother Jesus who went on my behalf and he paid a price and he found grace for me and he was able to establish that grace in my life that I could find strength and so now David's looking for Mephibosheth who's stuck in Lodabar but what he didn't know but there was a lasting covenant. Oh, I wish some of y'all could get a hold of this. There has been a blood covenant that's been established for those that will get out of Lodabar. A blood covenant given to us. See, we understand through this covenant that there was a loving friendship that was developed through Jonathan and David. And this loving friendship lived beyond the very life of Jonathan. And that loving friendship gave birth to something that was a promise that was made from David to Jonathan and Jonathan to David. And David thought longingly and kindly about Jonathan. How could he do something to honor this man that he loved so much? So he sends word to Lodabar. Hey, Mephibosheth, you need to get out of that place and come to the palace. Come to the palace. I promised something. I want to return that promise. See, there was a life that was given. There was a life and a price that was paid for you and I. We were separated, lost, and undone in our sins. Even God demonstrated that loss to us. Even while we were lost and undone, He gave Himself for us. He didn't give Himself for you after you had cleaned yourself up. He gave Himself for you when you were lost in Lodabar. He said, I've got plans for you. I've got a hope for you. I've got something I want to do with your life. But you've got to get out of Lodabar. A gracious king looking for someone that would accept his invitation. You see, God's promises to you and I are not reflective on your abilities. His promises are based upon his character, not on your abilities, not on your worth. He loves you right in this moment when you're lost and undone in Lodabar. When you've been at your worst, when you're just feeling sorry for yourself, when you don't want to get up and go no more. He's just cheering you on from the palace. And he said, if you'll just come to the palace, there's a place for you. We just like Lodabar too much. 
But there's a covenant that's been established for you and me. A covenant that will last. Romans 5 and 19 says, Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. And if it stopped there, we'd be a miserable bunch of people, wouldn't we? But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. Anybody up for a new life? Anybody getting tired of hanging out in Loda Bar? That place where there's no pasture, there's a place where there's no life, there's no possibility, there's no future, there's no purpose, just living day to day with no hope of anything getting better. And so he calls forth and says, come to the palace. Come up here, Carlos. So here's what happens with Mephibosheth. He comes and he throws himself at the feet of the king. Get down there and get yourself dirty, son. <laughs> and the very words he said in the translation, what do I, who am a dog before the king, have anything to do for you? He just said, I'm nothing. I'm at your mercy. There's nothing of value I have to give to you. I'm worthless. I'm a dog. Very words. Now, I, I look at David as being a gracious king. And when David looked at Mephibosheth, he didn't see Mephibosheth. He saw Jonathan. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. He sees the price that was paid for your sin. He sees someone that he truly values of all, all things. And I just got to believe that David reached down and said, come on up here, Mephibosheth. Come on, Mephibosheth. I got somewhere for you to go. Have a seat at my table. That's a place that I've left for you for years. I've been trying to find you, Mephibosheth. You can always sit at my table. Nobody's going to take your spot. Nobody's going to come and bring accusation and say, what's he doing sitting here? I have, a, as a king, have decreed before my kingdom. He has a spot at my table. And I got news for you today, every last one of you. He's decreed through the heavens and through all of glory. You've got a spot at the table of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's no devil in hell that can come and take that spot away from you. There's no sin that you've committed that can separate you from God if you'll take your place at the table. But you've got to come out of Lodabar. No one can take your place away. Nobody. Devil's been lying to me all my life. Said, oh, I, you broke so many promises. You failed so many times. There's no way you'll have a seat at the table. I said, oh, shut up, devil. You quit lying to me. My Bible says to me, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Can... The devils of hell can famine, can it? No, he's promised me that I have a seat at his table. But here's the deal. You've got to accept the invitation. Hey, Danny, you want to come sit at my table? Come on, man, sit at my table. Come on up here, man. Food will be served directly. We're just getting ready. Jacob, you want to sit at my table? You don't want to sit at my table? I don't think I'm dressed for that. My own son won't sit at my table. Rebecca, you want to come sit at my table? Yes, I do. Come on up here, Rebecca. Woo! Sit at my table. Go on and have a seat up there. No. You want to sit at my table? Come on up here, brother. We're going to have a good old time at the table. Sit at my table. Come on up here, friend. Come on. Hey, Kenny, you want to sit at my table? Kenny, you don't want to sit at my table? What in the world? Help to Jesus. 
You want to sit at my table? Go have a seat. Man, I'm running out of room. I got one seat left. You know, an earthly table runs out of room. You know, we as people, we want to entertain people, help people. We run out of room. But God's got this stack of unseen extensions on his table. Landis built a table for me several years ago. It's a beautiful table. And when it's just Vicky and I and a few of the kids, we can just make it small. But when grandkids show up, we had to add a leaf. But eventually that leaf's going to run out of spots. But I got news for you today. God's got a table that's got leaves that you don't see. And he's saying, whoever wants to come to my table can come to my table. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what your past says. I don't care what the devil told you. There's a seat at my table, but you got to accept the invitation. You got to get out of the loader bar. You got to quit listening. You got to quit. You got to quit doing the things that people do in Loda Bar. See, Loda Bar is where they just get through. Loda Bar is just a place where they just exist. Loda Bar, they just stay where they're at in order to go to the palace. You got to get up and go. You got to receive the invitation. You got to accept the grace of God. You got to apply the grace of God and begin to behave like a child of the king. You see, Mephibosheth, it wasn't just for Mephibosheth. It was for his kids and his grandkids. David said, as long as I'm king of this place, Mephibosheth and your family and all of the lineage of Jonathan is going to have a seat at the table. Some of you right now, if you'll get on board and begin to trust God and take your seat at the table, you'll make a pathway for those that need to find him. Continual favor. God doesn't say, I've had enough of you. Leave here. He says, keep on coming back. Luke 14, 15 through 23, shares a parable that Jesus shared. It says, a man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to tell the guests, come to the banquet, it's ready. But they all began to make excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. And the servant returned and told his master what he had said. And the master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the towns and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And after the servant had done this, he reported, there's still room for more. So the master said, go out into the country. Behind the hedges and through the lanes, urge anyone you can find to come so that the house will be full. There's a seat. You're going to have to leave where you've been to get where you're going. Now, I got news for you. I'm, I'm getting ready to close. We got churches built in Lodabar. So we hang out in Lodabar so long, we say, well, we might want to act like we're religious. So let's build a church. We don't believe anything good's going to come of it, but at least we can say we went to church. At least we can do the religious thing. That's not where God hangs out, folks. Some of you here today, you need to make a decision to leave Lodabar. Leave Lodabar. Leave your disappointment behind. Leave your sin behind. Leave the entrapment of your past behind. Walk to the palace. Let the Savior pick you up and brush you off so he can seat you at the table where there is blessing forevermore. I don't know about you, but I think the palace sounds a whole lot better than Lodabar. Would you stand with me this morning? They're going to sing a song here. It's a fairly new song. I'm not going to have you bow your head and raise your hand today. A lot of times I'll do that just to give you a place, a moment of intimacy where you can maybe without really 
being seen, you can reflect some things that are going on internally. But if you're going to leave Lodabar, it's got to be intentional. Etch this in your mind. You will never get out of Lodabar unless you walk out with intention. It's an intentional act. Mephibosheth probably had some fear when the call came. David has called for you to come to the palace. What if he kills me? What if he asks me to do something I can't do? There were probably tons of questions, but he had to have faith that when he got there, God was going to take care of him. Some of you today, I want you to make an intentional act. Some of you, maybe you're stuck in disappointment or you're stuck in sorrow or you're stuck in bitterness or you're trapped by addiction. There's multitudes of things that maybe you're struggling. Maybe you've just given up on the idea that life will ever get any better for you. I've got news for you. That is the word from Lodabar. Word from the palace says, Behold, old things have passed away and all things become new. The word from the palace says, I'm a child of the king. And I want you to walk up here as an intentional act and say, I want to get out of love. This song says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Some of you need to get out of fear and get on to faith. And God will help you. You want to get out of Lodabar bar today. And you may have been walking with the Lord and you say, I don't know how I ended up in Lodabar, bar, but I'm in Lodabar. bar. I want you to come up here and say, Lord, I will not dwell there any longer. I'm going to walk into my future, and I'm going to walk into my hope. She sings this song. Declare it today through your footsteps. I am not a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. And because of that, I am blessed, and I have a seat at the table of the king. Come on. Hold back. Come on. With a melody, and you surround me with a song. It's a deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Hallelujah. And I'm no longer. Love has called my name, and I've been born again into your family, and your blood flows through my veins, and I'm no longer.
it's with the melody and you surround me with a song it's of deliverance for all my enemies until all my fears are gone sing it with me and i'm no Second part of that, and I'm sitting at the table. One more time. I'm sitting at the table. You come out of Lota Bar and have your seat at the table. He's prepared it for you. Amen. Can we give God praise this morning? Yes. Don't forget our meeting tonight, six o'clock, choir at five. Thank you so much. We do have our Bible study. We didn't have it Wednesday because of the weather. We'll be doing it again on Wednesday. Great Bible study, Battlefield of the Minds. Come and be blessed. Brother Tommy, can you pray a blessing, a prayer over our benediction? Father, thank you, God, for your word. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace, God, and peace.